I pledge allegiance to the, no, that's not a good one. I'm sorry. It's picking you. Yeah. Fine. Okay. Okay. Green light means it's on. Okay.
Hello, welcome everyone, good afternoon. We are going to start the event shortly. It's going, I'm very excited to introduce um, first, it'll be Dean Solomon. Dean Mike Solomon has started his tenure at University of Michigan in 1997, and he served as a professor of chemical engineering, as well as currently serving as dean and vice provost of Rackham Graduate School. So we will first introduce Dean Solomon, and we'll proceed with further speakers, including Christine Chavez, daughter of Cesar Chavez, as well as other leaders across campus. We ask that you guys hold your questions until the end, and myself and the other MC floor are going to go around with a mic if anyone has questions at the end. So with, for, without further ado, please welcome Dean Mike Solomon. Thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here. Good afternoon. Uh, those of you that are here in person and those of you joining us online, I welcome you. I'm Dean of the Graduate School and I'm delighted to be with you here as we mark our first celebration of the Cesar Chavez Day of Service and Learning at the Rackham Graduate School. I would first like to acknowledge the efforts of all the people who made this day possible. Thank you to Rackham's DNI Strategic Action Lead Team for initiating this event and bringing it to fruition. Thank you to our earlier student panelists and to all of you from the UM community and beyond for joining us and enriching this experience in so many ways. I also wanna thank the UM Center for Educational Outreach who partnered with Rackham to bring more than 150 high school students from a variety of Detroit schools. And thank you to the Rackham staff members working on even the smallest details that made such a big difference today. And of course, thank you to Christine Chavez for coming to Ann Arbor to engage with us on lessons we can take from her career and from the legacy of her grandfather, Cesar Chavez. Christine, I in particular appreciate your willingness to spend the day with us, to engage with multiple, with our staff, with our students, and now our broader community um, in this campus event. Many of the areas where Christine has shown leadership and commitment throughout her life intersect with work that we are keenly interested in at Rackham. She has complemented her labor activism with an unwavering advancement of social justice. The Graduate School strives to foster an environment in which members of our community feel valued and welcome, and in which we embrace the perspectives of students to come, who come from us from across the country, around the world, and from a wide range of backgrounds and circumstances. Creating such a sense of belonging today is vital for an organization like Rackham, which has a responsibility to address the gaps in inclusion and support that are part of our history as a predominantly white institution. This important work also counters the growing threats to diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts we are seeing nationally on campuses and in workplaces. Cesar Chavez Day is a day of both learning and service, and that learning and service can take so many forms. Today's organizing committee has partnered, for example, with food gatherers to set up a Lunches of Love drive to support those facing food scarcity in our area. UM also has great resources, such as the Ginsburg Center, for those who wish to engage in service opportunities. And each year, Rackham's program and public scholarship helps bring together students and community members to identify mutually beneficial pro projects that achieve shared goals. Recent examples range from working with refugees building a new life in Grand Rapids, to collaborating with Great Lakes farmers on how to use cover crops for better economic and environmental outcomes. Seeing research and scholarship applied in this way is deeply meaningful to me, because if there is one thing I often hear from students and others, it is the importance of putting our words and ideas into practice. That is, in this case, integrating learning and service, a notion that I think is exemplified by Cesar Chavez this day and our keynote speaker today. And so now I'd like to turn things over to Michelle Facto, who will introduce Christine. Michelle is director of the Center for Labor and Community Studies at UM Dearborn, and has been a union representative and labor educator for over 35 years. Prior to becoming director of the center in 2022, she worked at Wayne State University, where she served as the executive director of the American Association of University Professors from 2007 to 2022 and is a labor educator at Wayne State's Labor Studies Center from 1996 until 2007. Michelle received undergraduate and graduate degrees from Michigan State University with a master's in labor and industrial relations. She's an activist for the rights of workers, unions, 
people with disabilities, those in the foster care system, and those in the LGBTQ plus community. Please join me in welcoming Michelle Fecteau. Thank you. also turn on my mic in my pocket, right? <laughs> okay, well maybe that's for later, so excuse me. So um, I also wanted to thank everybody as well. Um, Dean Solomon, my friend, Assistant Dean Bramer, um, members of the Rackham Graduate School community, the folks who created the food, the folks who maintain this building, the folks who clean the building, um, all the students and participants, um, thank you all, um, especially Thank you to Christine Chavez, um, who uh, is here making this uh, extra special event on your grandfather's 97th birthday. So thank you. Um, so I wanted to just take a little point of privilege and let you know about the Labor Study Center. It's been in existence at U of M since 1957, but I'm finding since I've been here, many, many people don't know about it. So I just want to have a little plug for what we do. Um, we provide non-credit certificate education to, um, for union and community activists and those aspiring to be union and community activists. Um, we, we really do follow in the footsteps of Cesar Chavez in that we believe that you don't need a formal education. It's, it's nice to have, <laughs> but you don't necessarily need a formal education to be a brilliant and uh, a leader and somebody who has the foresight to lead. Um, so we, in our program, the workers are the ones who do the planning of our conferences. They do the facilitating, the teaching. They become coordinators. They come to learn and to teach because we believe everyone has knowledge and experience to share, and that's value. And that's something Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta really felt strongly about, and, and we do too. Um, so, um, I also wanted to make clear <laughs> that um, unions nowadays um, are not just for farm workers and manufacturers. Uh, that's, you know, they've led the way in many ways with, uh, you know, incredible organizing and from trial and error <laughs> too. Um, but, you know, we have people who are organizing unions and that I've, I've either taught or represented that are faculty professors, MDs, um, gig workers, teachers, uh, baristas, lecturers, graduate students, um, hospital workers, uh, and more. And these are people uh, that will benefit from coming together and unionizing um, regardless of their profession. So, um, and then recently, well, some people think unions are a thing of the past, but uh, just a recent uh, study came out uh, from Bloomberg's Law Quarterly Union Wage Report that said that con union contracts negotiated in 2023 gave working people an average first year increase of 6.6% wage increase. Now that didn't always happen to non-union people, but that was the average for union people, 6.6 .6 in their first year of their contract. It's the highest in 36 years from when they started recording this. So that's today. Um, in newly released data from the Federal Reserve Survey on con of consumer finances find that union households have 1.7 times more median wealth than non-union households. And not only that, union membership helps narrow the wealth gap, um, ensuring that workers of color get the same deal that everyone else gets, because it's union contracts standardized. They also make things a lot more transparent. While union membership increases median wealth for white ho households by 37%, it increases median wealth for households of color by 167% to 228%. And whether you went to college or entered an apprenticeship program, the wealth, the median wealth of union households is greater than that of non-union households across every educational level. Just wanted to say that. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> Um, so at our center, we work on these issues. We're also work looking for student interns and uh, for uh, volunteers, if anyone is interested in something like that. Or if you care about issues of poverty, if you care about issues of wealth inequality, if you care about issues of racial inequity, you gotta support unions. You have to be a supportive union because it's a strong vehicle 
to create that kind of change. So I encourage you to uh, consider that. Or if you're researching, do some research on the effects of unionism. <laughs> um, so when did you learn about unions? I learned about unions uh, from my mother when I asked her why she was refusing to buy grapes. I was five. She, uh, even though my father was a president of his local teachers union, he wasn't home much, and my mother was a soft-spoken homemaker in a mill town called Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and uh, she introduced me. She explained about the farm workers' union, that they were on strike, the ugly conditions, the low pay, the indignities that they faced uh, picking grapes. And she said, we could help them by not buying grapes. So, you know, maybe somebody around my age had the same experience. I don't know. Is there anybody? Maybe your parents or grandparents. Okay, grandparents. <laughs> so it was Cesar Chavez and his compatriots organizing Filipino worker grape, grape pickers over 3,000 miles away from Pawtucket, Rhode Island that moved my mother to take action. That's some fierce organizing. That's some visionary organizing, how that was done. Um, so there was no internet, there's no social media, you know, it was, it was incredibly remarkable and I encourage you to study that and I'm curious to hear from Christine about more about that. Um, and also today there's a, a, a movement within the labor movement called bargaining for the common good, which, you know, so the whole ideals of what Cesar Chavez was doing is not gone. There's this whole movement now that when you go to negotiate a contract that you add things and you, co you connect with the community. For example, we have um, teachers organizing for funds be set aside for homeless students and, and for free busing for low income students. We have uh, county um, employees out in California asking that funds be shifted from prisons to education and resources to help those avoid prison. So it's things like that. Um, that are going on now, and that that's actually part of the bargaining demands. Anyway, like her grandfather, Christine Chavez has had a lifetime commitment to civil rights and labor movement and community organizing. She was born in the city of Delano, in the heart of California's Central Valley, Valley where she is surrounded by farm, the farm workers movement. Today, Christine works for the US Department of Agriculture's Natural Resources Conservation Service. She works on public affairs team doing out, as an outreach coordinator where she's working with um, underserved farmers, including Hmong, Latino, African-American, veterans, LGBT, and women. Her grandfather would be so proud. <laughs> um, Latina Magazine named Christine one of the top Latinas for her longtime involvement with civil rights issues, particularly her work on marriage equality. She has been recognized by the Bay City Lawyers for Individual Freedom and National Gay and Lesbian Task Force uh, for leadership on helping to end discrimination. Until recently, Christine also served on the board of the Freedom to Marry. Thank you. <laughs> Various women organizations such as the Chicano Latina Foundation of San Francisco and the Rhode Islands, which I think is interesting from California to Rhode Island, um, and the Rhode Island Women's Fund paid tribute to Christine's dedication and hard work. In the, in the coming weeks, she will extend her support to organizations working to empower women, such as the Latino uh, Initiative of Denver and the Michigan State Latina Leadership Conference. Christine's work has not been limited to farm workers. She understands that solidarity with other unions is the labor's lifeblood. Absolutely. Over the years, Christine has joined workers of the Service Employees International Union 1877 in their battle against the LA International Airport. United Food and Commercial Workers strike against California supermarkets and the hotel and restaurant employees long fights against LA's area hotels in, southern, in the Southern, um, excuse me, the University of Southern California. Christine considers her ongoing involvement with Latino and African American Leadership Alliance as an important project to bring two historically disenfranchised communities together to forge peace and unity. Christine resides in Davis, California with her husband, Oscar, and their dog, Jetty. She's only allowed to have one dog, but I learned this over lunch, okay. Her work is based on the values passed down to her from her grandfather, Cesar Chavez. The fight for civil rights, justice, 
and labor equality. Thank you. And I uh, please give a warm welcome to Christine Chavez as she comes to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, is this what you were, okay. Don't let me do that, please. Okay, there we go. That's an old picture, okay. Um, but first, thank you so much for inviting you, um, for inviting me to be here today. Um, thank you for that, for that kind introduction, and thank you for sharing your work um, with all of us. Um, Dean Solomon, uh, it was the first time anyone has ever um, gave opening remarks and mentioned cover crops, which is my whole work is around cover crops. So thank you for that. Um, I had mentioned um, this will be my third time speaking today, but I'm always happy to come um, to Michigan just because of the amount of support that was given to the farm workers for so many years. I can tell you every single place that I've went, someone has mentioned that they boycotted grapes, that they loaned um, somebody their car, that they, my grandfather slept at their home. And so just thank you so much for all of that support. Um, I, just a little background on myself. Um, Caesar was my mom's um, father. I'm one of 31 grandchildren. My mom, Sylvia, um, is Caesar's oldest daughter. Um, and I always tell people that for me, it was really my mom who instilled in us the sense of pride that we should feel as women, as uh, Mexican Americans, and as the granddaughters of Caesar Chavez. Um, from the time that we were very little, she used to make us wear, you know when you would take your school pictures every year? Um, my mom used to make us, my sister Teresa and I, wear this, this red UFW button in all of our school pictures. And she said it's because when she was growing up and my grandfather was starting to change things in this small agricultural community, they weren't allowed to wear the UFW button. So you can see me and my sister in you know, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, we always had on the UFW button because it was so important for her, um, for us to do that. But before I go any further, I want to make sure that everyone knows that we're talking about Cesar Chavez, the labor leader. I was at a fundraiser several years ago now, and we were raising money for United Farm Workers, and it said, um, come here, you know, the granddaughter of Cesar Chavez speak. And so we're at the venue, and these boxing promoters show up, and they have, you know, they're giving us a $5,000 check, which is nice, and they're auctioning off like boxing gloves. They give us stuff to auction off and they're just so wonderful. And I told my husband, I was like, this is weird. Why is there boxing promoters at an event for Cesar Chavez? And so I said, go over and you know, ask him what they're doing here. You know, what's the connection? So he goes over and he comes back. He goes, oh my God, they think you're Julio Cesar Chavez's <laughs> granddaughter. And so I said, oh my gosh, and he's like, you have to tell them who it is. And I was like, no, what if they take the check back? <laughs> um, so I went over and I told the guy, I was like, actually, we're talking about um, Cesar Chavez, the leader of the farm workers. And he looks at me and he goes, that dude was cool too. You can keep the money. I was like, okay, good, good. <clears throat> You know, people always say, what did you do with your grandfather? What did you guys, you know, how did you hang out with them? And he never took us. He wasn't like a traditional grandpa. We didn't do the baseball games and things like that. But he found creative ways for us to, to be involved um, in the movement. We volunteered at the UFW offices. We went to marches and rallies and um, you know, and it was never just, you know, m me and my sisters, but it was everybody. And so, because he, he wanted his entire family, um, you know, all of his eight children and their grandchildren to be involved with the cause for farm workers. He used to always tell us his big thing was like, guys, in this family, we don't have family picnics, but we have family pickets. And he would always <laughs> tell us that, yes, we know. Um, and I think that while I learned so many lessons um, from my grandfather, I think probably two of the most important things um, were about solidarity and commitment. Um, the first one about labor solidarity, when I was um, 15 years old, my sister Teresa and I were invited um, by my grandfather to go to Manhattan 
for he had a speaking engagement, and so he asked if we could go also. And we'd never been on an airplane. We certainly had never been, you know, out of California or New York, going to New York City. Um, and so we were very excited. So when we're on the airplane, we're looking through his, um, the host organization put together like a book of all the stuff he was going to be doing. So we're looking through the, um, through the itinerary and we notice that the host organization has him staying at a park, a, a hotel called the Park Plaza Hotel, which is this beautiful hotel right in the city of Manhattan. And so we are so excited. We're like, oh, let's try and get him to allow us to stay at this hotel instead of going to a supporter's house. Because like I mentioned before, my grandfather had this thing. He would never stay in hotels. He would say, no matter where I go across this country, I could find a supporter and stay in their home. But we wanted to stay at the Park Plaza Hotel. <laughs> so we're like, okay, let's just ask him. So we ask and he's like, no, no, we're not gonna stay at the hotel. And we're like, come on, like we've never stayed in a fancy hotel, you gotta let us. So finally he says, okay, we can, you guys will stay one night at the Park Plaza Hotel. So we're so excited. So the host organization comes to pick us up and we are um, driving to the Park Plaza Hotel and as soon as we get an eye shot of that hotel, there's a picket line of hotel workers out in front of that hotel. So not only did we not get to stay at the Park Plaza Hotel, we learned about labor solidarity because he made us walk the picket line with those hotel workers for the rest of the time we were there. So I've never forgotten about labor solidarity. Um, the following year, when I was 16, um, or maybe a few years, 14, 16, is when I really began to realize who my grandfather was and what kind of impact that he had on people. Um, it was the summer of 1988, and my grandmother, Helen, had called us to Delano, the birthplace of the UFW, and she told our entire family, she said, your grandfather has been fasting. Um, he's, he'd been fasting for 10 days then, um, and she said, we'd heard about the fast in the 60s, but I don't think that any of us were prepared for what was to come that summer. So that summer at the age of 61, we saw my grandfather conduct his longest public fast of 36 days on water only to bring public attention to the pesticide poisoning of farm workers and their children. And while he fasted, we saw him go from a very active and vibrant person to being bedridden and almost losing his life. And I've never witnessed that level of commitment and dedication in any person before or since. And it was, my grandfather had that same level of commitment in 1962 when he and Dolores Huerta found the National Farm Workers Association, which later would become the UFW. I think that he had such a connection with the struggle of farm workers because he too was a farm worker. All through his teenage years, he worked in the fields and he knew firsthand the way that some of the farm workers were treated. After serving in the United States Navy in World War II, he met my grandmother, Helen, and they settled in Delano, California. Several years later, they moved to follow the crops from Delano to East San Jose to a neighborhood called South Si Puedes, which, which translates to get out if you can. The next person that would come into his life would eventually change his life forever. His name was Fred Ross, and he was a community organizer with the Community Service Organization. And the CSO was a civil rights organization that fought for the poor and disenfranchised. And everyone tells the story that um, Fred Ross had went to a local church and said, I'm, I'm trying to find leaders for, to, start this, to start this union, to start this movement, start this community organization. And so the priest told him, oh, you have to talk to Cesar Chavez. Sometimes he's out in the fields and he's the one that's um, you know, standing up for workers. You have to find Cesar Chavez. And so he... Got, got an address, went to my grandfather's home, knocked on the door, and my grandfather said, I want nothing to do with you. Because my grandfather said that a lot of times students um, would come from different universities to study poor people in the barrio and never really do anything after that. So he assumed that Fred Ross was one of those people. But Fred Ross was a community organizer, so he went back and back and back 
until finally he was able to get his foot in the door and talk to my grandfather about the work that he was doing with the community service organization. So he would eventually convince my grandmother, my grandfather, to leave working in the field and go work with community service organization. And while my grandfather did that, he registered thousands of Mexican Americans to vote for the first time, and he also became the executive director of CSO. And while they did great work with the CSO out in East Los Angeles, California, my grandfather always had in the back of his mind farm workers. He always wanted to organize farm workers, and he never forgot about his time as a farm worker. So he would leave CSO and take my grandmother and their eight children all the way back to Oxnard, California, to begin organizing farm workers into their union. Um, my grandfather was a civil rights Latino farm worker and labor leader. And like most courageous leaders, my grandfather was a strong believer in the principles of nonviolence practiced by Gandhi and Dr. Martin Luther King. He used peaceful tactics such as fasts and boycotts, strikes, and pilgrimages. No two people had a stronger influence on my grandfather than Dr. King and Gandhi. He studied the Birmingham bus boycott, and he learned about the spiritual meaning of fasting from Gandhi. In 1968, Caesar and the UFW began the great boycott to take the issue of farm workers to the American public. Caesar and the farm workers knew that if the American public could see what farm workers had to endure to put food on their tables, they would respond. So farm workers who barely spoke English and many of whom had not been outside of California moved to cities like Chicago, Boston, Denver, here in Michigan and New York to spread the word about the Great Boycott. At one time, more than 17 million Americans were participating in the Great Boycott. And for those of you here whose parents or grandparents participated, we say thank you. We like to say that the farm workers created that spark that went throughout the entire Latino community. And Latinos looked and said if it could happen in the fields among the poorest of us, the least educated, it could happen everywhere in the courts, in the political arena, and in our schools. Several years ago, the United Farm Workers celebrated their 50th year anniversary. For 50 years, the UFW has been on the forefront of bringing the plight of farm workers to the American public. I think that one of the greatest things the UFW realized early on was that organizational diversity is an absolute strength and key component to build a lasting and solid organization. I was reminded that my grandfather was often criticized for having non-Latinos in leadership positions, but he believed that having other people involved only added to the success of this mostly Latino union. He knew that having people with different backgrounds and experiences could only serve the union better because they would bring different opinions. And they knew that working with these folks and coordinating a state-by-state -state effort of the boycott of California table grapes they could put economic pressure on the growers to do the right thing. So they built coalitions with civil rights leaders like John Lewis, Reverend Jesse Jackson. I would like to expand on this coalition because I think that outside of the Latino community, it was the black community that supported the farm workers for so many years. Like I had mentioned, my grandfather studied the civil rights movement, in particular the bus boycott, and applied the same tactics to the boycott of grapes. And although Dr. King and my grandfather never met, he was my grandfather's hero and played a large part in his work. At the height of the boycott, he sent this telegram to my grandfather. I'm gonna take some water first. So it says, to Cesar Chavez, United Farm Workers, Delano, California. I'm deeply moved by your courage in fasting as your personal sacrifice for justice through nonviolence. Your past and present commitment is eloquent testimony to the constructive power of nonviolent action and the destructive impotence of violent reprisal. You stand today as a living example of the Gandhian tradition with its great force for social progress and its healing spiritual powers. My colleagues and I commend you for your bravery, salute you for your work against poverty and injustice, and pray for your health and your continuing service as one of the outstanding men of America. The plight of your people and ours is so grave that we all desperately need the inspiring example and effective leadership you have given. Martin Luther King Jr., President of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. 
And after Dr. King was assassinated, it was his wife, Coretta Scott King, who took up the cause of the farm workers. So we always acknowledge and understand how important these coalitions and diversity are. On April 23rd in 1993, we got the call that my grandfather had passed away. He died at the home of a farm worker family in Arizona. He passed away in his sleep, and when his colleagues found him, he looked peaceful, and lying across, across his chest was a book about Native American artifacts. Several days later, 40,000 people came to pay their respects to him. He was buried as farm workers are in a simple pine casket. My grandfather used to say he wouldn't have worked a day in his life if he knew this movement would not go on without him. When I reflect on my time with him, I remember him telling us that we may not work in agriculture, some of us may not work in agriculture, but that it was our responsibility to remind people so often about what farm workers have to go through to put food on your tables. He said the American people are good people and will always respond to the rights of farm workers. And today, he would want that focus to continue to be on the farm workers. And today, we encourage people to get involved with, UF, with the United Farm Workers. Um, so thank you. I'm going to go through some of the slides now, if that's OK, and then we'll open it up for questions. OK. Um, so I wanted to put together these slides just because I'm always just talking and talking. So I wanted to sort of break it up a little, and then we'll just go through. And this is just some of the, some of the things that I've been involved, with, involved um, in. Is that going to go? OK, so I just titled this In the Beginning with, we used to call him Thought the Caesar. Um, so that's me um, on the left uh, at a march in, in Salinas. We lived very close to um, Salinas. So when my grandfather would come from Kern County, um, from Central California, he would come and pick us up, and we, uh, we would go up with him to marches. Um, the second one here, as you can see, it says boycott AMP. Some of you may know AMP. So, and it was a, a newspaper clipping. It says, even the youngest in the UFW Chavez family picket AMP. So my mom tells us, and I don't remember this because we were too little. I was four, my sister was six, but um, we moved here for a couple of years to work on the great boycott, and we were... Uh, picketing outside this AMP supermarket, and the police came, and they wanted to talk to the picket captain. So my mom thought it would be cute to you know, make a little note and attach it to my sister Teresa's. So when the police came, they asked, who's the picket captain? So my mom said my sister Teresa was, <laughs> and to speak with her. Um, and so my mom says this was our first introduction to civil disobedience, because we were arrested with the, I was arrested with my parents then. Um, so that was my first introduction. And then this is just sisters in the movement. Once again, we're at some march there, me and my, and now our other sister, Monica, is involved there. And then my grandfather would always say, you say something, say something. So he would make us say something, too, at a different rally. So that's my sister, Teresa, having to do that. Um, and you know, we never looked at this as like a chore or anything, because all of our, everybody would be there. Like, it was almost like family reunion all the time because all of our cousins and, you know, it was a great time. Okay. So this is just, I call this women in the struggle. It's just some of the women that, you know, took up the cause of farm workers after their husbands were assassinated. So you have Ethel Kennedy there who time and time again, I mean, even today will write letters and use her stature to, you know, uh, call attention to the rights of farm workers. Also, Miss Coretta Scott King, um, this was a picture that was taken um, in Salinas on Christmas Eve. She gave up her Christmas Eve to come and you know, uh, fight for the rights of farm workers there in the valley. So this is marriage equality. So um, when I was working, um, I served as political director for many years at, at the United Farm Workers. And we worked a lot, of course, in the legislature, and um, in 2008, yeah, 2008, um, our um, governor wanted to allow gay and lesbians to marry, 
And you know, there was all this controversy about it. And so a legislator called me into her office and said, you know, she handed me something. She said, what do you see right here? And it was a poll. And she was showing me that when Latinos are polled on the issue of gay marriage, we're not exactly where we needed to be back then. So she said, you need to do a commitment ceremony and remind Latinos about, you know, who respect your grandfather, you need to remind them about your grandfather's support of the LGBT community. So we did commitment ceremonies there at the California Supreme Court and we fed the story to the LA Times and there was some controversy. Um, but I know that it was the right thing to do because I know that my grandfather always for so many years supported the gay and lesbian community and in fact the largest group that he ever spoke to was in Washington, D.C. at the big LGBT march. And then the Latino GLBT History Project is just a group that I've been involved with that talks about, um, about Latinos um, and their um, involvement in um, marriage equality. So this is showing solidarity with, um, with workers. Um, so the first one is um, that was a, a strike against um, uh, grocery stores out in, in California. You can see Dolores Huerta there also about to get arrested next. Um, and then this one was um, a fight with the um, Justice for Janitors campaign. My grandfather always used to say that the janitors are the farm workers of the cities because they sort of go under the radar and do all this important work to keep all these facilities beautiful, and then they're kind of gone. Um, so that was just showing solidarity. I always show solidarity, Michelle. Okay. Um, so this is probably my, probably my most favorite quote by my grandfather, and he said, we don't need perfect political systems, but we need perfect participation. Um, so every year, because we're not a swing state, I'm sure you guys all know what that is here, um, but you know, California is not a swing state, so we go different places to um, encourage Latinos to get out and vote. So the first picture, um, we were in Nevada, and this little guy, you know, I was walking around, as you could see, some houses are fenced off. And so this little guy came over on his bike and he's like, oh, that person doesn't live here, this person's this. this. And so he was like my little, like showing me around, telling me what to, this person gets home this time and this time. So he became my little buddy so I could go and encourage people to go vote. And then the second one is um, we were out in Arizona um, getting out the vote there and the woman on the left um, is my boss from USDA. She had just retired and she knew that I do, that I go out and, you know, and do this um, sort of work on my off time and she called me up and said, I want to go with you. And so I said, come on, Anita. So that was us and the girl in the middle was um, just a voter that we were talking to and thank God for all the Latinas in Arizona because that is why they won Arizona. So, so it's just some of the political work that I've done. And see. And then just I've talked about this so much today. It's just the coalition building um, that the UFW, it's always been my favorite thing about UFWs that we've always been able to bring different groups together to support the cause of farm workers. Um, the first, this was a march in 2022. Um, Governor Gavin Newsom wasn't where he needed to be on a piece of our legislation. So we did a march from um, Central Valley to, to his house in Sacramento, to the Capitol. Um, and this was the final day of the march. And you can see the first slide. You can't see so good, but it's Filipino students. Um, the second one is white coats, doctors, uh, medical students coming. The third slide there is members from the Jewish community, again, coming to the... Um, uh, coming to help the farm workers, and then of course our low rider, our nice low rider friends also coming. So it's just always, that's what I've always appreciated about UFW and the different marches, and it's just seeing so many different groups of people coming together to support farm workers. Let's see. And that's my parents. Um, we were getting an award for our work around um, uh, gay marriage, and so from the the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. So my parents um, came to support me. I remember my mom's very feisty. I remember telling her, Mom, we're going to do this event. You know, we're going to speed the story to the LA Times. If anybody says anything to you, she's like, I dare somebody to say something to me. I was like, OK, nobody better. So that's my mom and dad. 
And then, oh, this is my, my cousins um, who are just so special to me. Um, we're on a text every day, and we've got, you know, some are teachers, some are, um, my sister's a, a city planner, my other sister works at Google, my cousin Julie in the front with, it says the future is Latina, she's the campaign manager for the Joe Biden campaign this year. So everybody sort of just does different things, but we're all connected because of United Farm Workers. Um, and then the queen, my grandmother, who is just, I think, for all of us, she was just the most important person in our family, and I think she's definitely the unsung hero of this movement. Um, I always you know, like to remind people that when my grandfather left um, working with the community service organization, they had eight kids, and my grandmother went to go work back in the fields so that my grandfather could begin you know, starting to organize farm workers. Um, it was my grandmother who comforted um, our entire family and the entire community when my grandfather passed away. She told everybody that we had to be strong for the workers. She never, like traditional grandma, she never forgot any of our birthdays. She could tell you where we all lived and what was the latest with our lives. And she had 31 grandchildren to look after. She knew all of our favorite meals and would have them prepared when we visited. Even my pesky vegan and vegetarian cousins could be accommodated. She loved Christmas. She loved making tamales. Um, she loved novellas. Uh, she loved a good steak and Santa Barbara, and she read daily. Um, she would always read these great books, and then she would tell us, oh, I just read you know, Isabel, uh, Isabel Allende's Paula. She read all of Jorge Ramos's books, and then she would call us and tell us to read them so that we could discuss them with her. And I say that you know, those, she did traditional Nana things, like cooking for us, but then she was also not traditional because I would call her sometimes and say, Nana, I'm gonna get arrested with the janitors, and she would be so excited and just so <laughs> happy for us. So that was her, her not Nana way. Um, when I went to work on the marriage equality campaign, they wanted to use pictures of her and my grandfather at their wedding to talk about, about love, and so she didn't hesitate. She allowed us to do that. Um, in this picture here, it was in 2012, um, the president came to, President Obama came to where my grandfather's buried up in King, California, and he was there on an official like government business, so you're really not supposed to lobby people there. So we had, as a family, said we're not gonna do that, because um, he was there to make um, my grandfather's resting place a national um, monu monument. And so um, my, the first thing my grandmother said to him when he took her hand, she said, you're gonna help the dreamers, right? You're gonna do that, right? And so that went out the window. But she was just always so special to us and just very, um, just so impactful on all of our lives and continues um, today. Oh. And then this is just some of the work that I've had the opportunity to do in, um, in California, I'm sorry, with Department of Agriculture after Hurricane Maria we were sent out to Puerto Rico to help some of the farmers out there rebuild um, their farms. Um, also, just some of the work I do with um, minority farmers and ranchers, talking about cover crops all the time. Um, uh, every year we host the um, Latino Farmer Conference, was, which is the first USDA conference done entirely in Spanish, um, letting workers know about all the different opportunities that the Department of Agriculture has. And then also in California, we created the first ever Black Farmers Conference to, bring, to bring, bring black farmers and urban farmers together to talk about different opportunities um, through USDA. And then lastly, someone asked earlier why I do all this work and why I continue work, and it's because of these two. So these are my um, nephews. I did not have children, but I have these two. Um, Idris and Isaiah, and more than anything, just the way that my um, grandfather and then the way that my mother 
um, taught us about these different issues and about farm workers and about different struggles, we want to make sure that Idris and Isaiah are also taught about that. So when we are long gone, they can carry it on. So thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. Thank you. That was incredible. I'm inspired on like every level that there can be. <laughs> oh, I'll leave this here. We'll have Michelle and Christine sit up here and we're gonna open the floor to any questions. Um, before that, I just want to say that the intersectionality of your work is so incredible and I love seeing how you guys address racial equity, queer community, and so many different levels of um, issues that we have in this country. So anyway, I will go around with the floor and we'll accept any questions that you have. So you can just raise your hand and we'll come up to you. Uh, hi, Christine. Um, I recently had the opportunity to highlight the work of a Rackham student uh, whose research is kind of at the intersection of environmental justice and then sustainable agriculture. And I know you talked about your cover crops. Um, I was just wondering, could you talk a little bit about sustainable agricultural uh, agricultural agriculture initiatives from uh, like the USDA perspective? Um, knowing that you know chemicals from industrial agriculture have effects not only for the environment but also for farm workers' health. So I work in our public affairs, so we tell the story of these um, farmers and ranchers to try and encourage other folks to use our program. So I work with our Natural Resources Conservation Service, um, which um, addresses um, resource concerns, you know, having to do with air, water, um, and soil. Um, I think that part of the work that I am responsible for doing is um, bringing in what we call um, underserved farmers and ranchers because we know that you know, we can look at the ag sense and, and see that there are, like for instance in California, there's 20,000 um, Latino owned farms, but they are not represented in our, you know, in our contracts and our agreements. Um, and they don't traditionally belong to like the big farm bureaus and the big agricultural groups. They're kind of just out there. So it's sort of our responsibility to bring them in to let them know about different opportunities that USDA has for them. So I'm not scientific in that part. I'm more of the outreach. And then we have the, you know, the folks that, that um, do that, do that work to, we offer technical assistance to them. Thank you so much, Ms. Chavez. We are so honored to have you here today at the University of Michigan. Uh, and I want to welcome you on behalf of the program in Latina Latino Studies on our campus, which is alive and well and, and greatly in admiration of your family. There's a mural of Cesar Chavez in our main conference room. So we, we keep his work uh, at the forefront of our thinking. I'm a theater professor and I teach a class where we talk a lot about the Teatro Campesino. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role that the arts play in union organizing and how people who are artists can get involved in supporting the struggle. Um, God, there's so much. So there's a new um, documentary out and it's called Song, Song for Caesar. And it just, it talks about all the different um, musical acts that came together to benefit farm workers. And it's, you know, Linda Ronstadt and Santana and Crosby, Stills and Nash. And I mean, it just, it just so many different acts that all came together. War and Tierra, all these group, different groups that came together to support the cause. Um, there's also... Um, Yes, Teatro Campesina. Campesina was just such a big influence on, on, um, on the farm worker movement. I think that from what I've heard in the past is that it really served to uplift the farm workers during times, you know, during these long marches or these long ca campaigns. It served as a way to bring some humor um, to, to the farm workers. Um, I know currently um, Lalo Alcaraz, who's a famous um, cartoonist, is releasing his first ever, it's called Los Farmworkers Beer. And so he designed, he made a really cool design 
Um, but yeah, the arts were definitely a huge um, part of the, of the farm worker movement for so many years. And thank you for coming. Um, just a question with, uh, with everything that's happening and with some of the legislation that's occurring right now, um, can you talk about a couple things that give you hope <laughs> that things are going to improve and get better? <laughs> I, can I tell you? Yes. Okay. I mean, so, so studies show at least um, two thirds, I think this is good news, two thirds of the American population support unions, which is the highest level in a long time. So I think that um, people are uh, supporting labor in a way that they haven't for, for many years. So I think that's optimistic and we have a very active, um, 2023 was incredibly active for the labor movement. So I see that the potential to have a resurgence of um, and better equality in our country, wealth equality. So. And then I think like with this, this last March in, in 2022, like we had a lot of legislators when the, it was, the bill was um, a bill to give farm workers a right to vote in secret elections, sort of vote by mail like we all get to do. That way there's not intimidate, they don't feel the intimidation at their work site. Um, and there was some legislators, some new legislators who were not supporting that bill and didn't really understand the kind of reach that farm workers had. We had um, a legislator out in San Jose, California, um, who you know, was like, I don't know if I'm gonna do that, but we called, our, and he's a member of the LGBT caucus. So we called our friends at the Gay and Lesbian Task Force. We called our friends at, at um, the Latino GLBT um, Society, and they put tremendous amount of pressure on him. And then the March, you know, the governor, he was like, I am not signing that bill. I mean, he went on forever. I am not. They wrote letters to him. They did this. And then finally they, you know, did this big march. And we, once again, we saw all these groups come back together. And we, they had, we had not done a march like that in years um, to, to, um, to address farm workers. And so um, it was just great to see everybody. So those types of things sort of give me hope. And even, you know, like at, at where I work at the Department of Agriculture, I had mentioned earlier that, you know, I'd never had any interaction with the USDA. Um, you know, my grandfather, Dolores Huerta, never went to the USDA. The only interaction that they had was when the great boycott was going on, the USDA would buy the grapes from the growers and ship them out, ship them overseas because they couldn't sell them here. Um, and so for the first time, our secretary, Tom Vilsack, went out and visited farm workers. I mean, it's the Department of Agriculture, but no secretary had ever sat down with farm workers before. And he even put on this UFW button and went you know, to different events after that and kept the button on. I was like, okay, you're in California. But he did it. But the things like that, you know, um, give me hope. Uh, my boss, Carlos Suarez, um, gives me hope that, you know, he continues to recruit um, young, uh, you know, engineers of color, biologists of color, um, you know, soil scientists of color that can really help us do that outreach to, to communities to bring them into USDA. Hi, uh, my name is Karthik. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment first. Uh, I think the graduate employees organization at the University of Michigan, which is the union that I'm part of, we were the first union to have a non-discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation in our contract in 1975. This was before like AFL-CIO adopted a similar resolution, getting all their locals to do that in probably the late 70s. But my main question was, uh, you know, it seems like the labor movement at large has not been waging a lot of protracted struggles that happened even in the 70s with UFW, uh, but really like nothing that nothing of the sort that happened in the 30s. Uh, uh, what, what do you do you see that changing now? Because uh, and what what do you think? What do you think uh, we can do using that? That's not just like basic collective bargaining and like you know what what are like transformational changes that we can see like social security and so on. Well, I think like for us. The, the workforce, um, the agricultural workforce, has changed dramatically from when um, 
Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta started organizing farm workers. Now it's like 80 to 80 to 90 percent of farm workers that work here don't have documentation to be in the country. So they are extremely fearful of uh, you know of union organizing. I have personally tried to do that work, and it is so difficult to go out into a field and talk to the workers when they are like, get away, my boss is right there. Like, they do not want to speak with you. Um, so that's why the union, you know, did that last march and put that legislation in place to give farm workers a chance to vote in secret elections so that their boss is not hovering over them. Um, yeah. If I could also yeah. add, um, so I, I started organizing back in the uh, 80s, the 83. 94. And, you know, and I've seen as the American um, population has embraced and, um, you know, especially around LGBTQ, I mean, it's been transformational. I mean, the, the people in the labor movement reflect our population as a whole. You know, so, you know, a lot of times they, it's not the labor movement who hires people, it's the employer. And then we are organizing and trying to educate people. So it often reflects our you know, where we are as a, as a country. I'd like to think we take a lead um, in that. And I've seen, um, you know, the, the, the AFL-CIO has something called Pride at Work, which has um, been around for a long time to promote LGBTQ plus workers. Um, and uh, I've, it's, in some industries, it's really hard where there's a macho kind of a, you know, manuf auto manufacturing, it's, uh, but there are more and more allies all the time. But I think it's up to all of us, you know, and it's, it's like the labor is not, a, it's just a reflection of our American population. And um, so it's, it's, all, it's all about us trying to make that change um, as best we can. And, uh, I, and I do see progress. I see progress. I just hope the next year we continue with the progress and don't regress. But I won't say any more on that. <laughs> Um, also, for the first time, I, did, I didn't mention this, but um, California is the only state where workers have the right to collectively bargain. Um, that was until last year, or two years ago, when the state of New York also now has the right to collectively bargain. And so the UFW has set up a full shop, and we've won three recent elections there um, in the state of New York. And so little by little, and like my grandfather always said, this movement is going to you know, it's not, I'm not going to see it in my lifetime. I'm probably not going to see it in my lifetime that we can organize everywhere, but little by little. You're, you're talking specifically the farm workers. Farm workers, yes, farm workers, yes. yes farm okay, workers, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, right. farm workers. Yes, yeah, sorry. Hi. Um, so pleased to have you here. I am Professor Sylvia Pedraza, Sociology and American Culture. When I was a student, I actually met your grandfather who came to Michigan and who spoke to us in the sociology department. And I know that one of the things are in, on his mind, I think at the time, was that he had become the face of the Chicano movement. But in fact, what he really, really wanted to be was a trade unionist, you know, to represent the farm workers. Um, and therefore, you know, the issue of uh, workers who were undocumented was difficult for him because he said on the one hand, you know, if a man is exploited, I will represent him. But on the other hand, they make it very hard for me to <laughs> actually unionize anybody. Um, so I was just wondering how widespread is the UFW today? I know that at the time when he founded it, it was successful in California and I believe in Ohio. Uh, we sometimes have people from Ohio who come here and speak. And I know that now there is a movement among the farm workers in Florida, in, in Mokali. Um, what, where, where else? Yeah. Um, yes, the Farm Labor or Organizing Committee out of Ohio has been very active. Um, like I had mentioned, the, the workforce has changed so drastically. And in some of these states, like Florida, it is almost impossible to organize farm workers. I mean, just last year in their House legislature, they said there will be no heat, Florida, there will be no heat regulations for farm workers. That means no reporting of farm worker deaths. That means no educating farm workers about, you know, that you need to take a break every so often, that you need to have water, that, you know, if, if it gets this hot. 
um, they don't have um, uh, shade. I mean, very basic things, you know, in some of these states. So it is extremely hard. The numbers of the UFW are not what they used to be in terms of, of organized um, farm workers. And it's a lot of it has to do with the status of farm workers not being able, um, you know, being undocumented. They continue to live in the shadows. And it's something that needs to be addressed. Everybody in agriculture knows it. We have, you know, farmers that are crying because they don't have any labor. So they hire these workers. And then when something goes wrong, all of a sudden this worker is reported. That still happens to this day. So it's extremely hard. And the farm workers that are, you know, that are courageous and take that first step to say that they, you know, want to talk to, to a union representative, it is very commendable for them to do that. Um, most recently, um, out in California, we won a union election with the wonderful company, you know, the, the big, huge, powerful, wonderful company. And of course, they are pushing back on that. Um, but, you know, it's, it, in many different states, um, farm workers are still very fearful to, to take that first step. I have a question from someone who'd submitted earlier. It is for both of you. What are some ways that you've effectively elevated marginalized voices, especially given the different demographics that both of you work with? So at our center, we have, um, and for many years, we have conferences. We have the Black Men in Unions. We have Michigan School for Women Workers. We have Latina, Latino Workers uh, Institute. We have um, worker pride for LGBT. So what we do is we have, uh, and also uh, uh, an advanced leadership conference for you know anyone. But, but the, all of the people who teach in those are either for the black men in unions. They're all the black men teach. Anyone's welcome to come and learn from um, these people. But it it gives them an opportunity. Uh, and we look at past participants and we look to elevate them to become instructors and then coordinators and get involved. They all involved in the planning of our conferences. So it's a way that we build leadership so that they, and we teach people how to run for office within the union, how to, uh, or run for office if they wanna go run for office in, um, for you know school board or state rep or whatever it is. So that, that's, those are things that our conference directly does to try to impact those groups, um, or, or anybody can attend, you know, but in particular, those groups. And we also, through my work at Department of Agriculture, like I had mentioned, we um, had the first ever um, all Spanish uh, Latino farmer conference. And it was difficult to find, you know, soil scientists to come and speak in Spanish to, um, to, to the Latino farmers um, that were there. But we knew that the farmers wanted to see people that look like them, you know, um, speaking to them about, about you know, soil health. Um, also with a Black Farmers Conference, um, uh, we make sure to bring in folks that are, um, you know, that are also black that can speak to the farmers about different opportunities. Um, we do a tremendous amount of recruitment um, at Hispanic serving institutions and historically black colleges to try and bring in, um, uh, those voices uh, also. Hello, thank you for coming. Um, understanding that not everyone studies labor movements or agriculture, um, a lot of the students here will become, you know, architects and doctors and things like that. What call to action do you want them to leave with? Perfect. Um, I would just encourage everyone to go to ufw.org. Um, and there are so many different opportunities that you could be involved in, from writing a letter. Um, and nowadays, it's just like a click or, you know, back in the day, right? There were so many other different ways. But now, nowadays, um, it's as simple as, you know, following, our, following the UFW page. Um, there would be tons of calls to action, um, you know, sending letters um, to legislators. Um, yeah, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Oh. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of activity going on right now. I mean, um, well, the UAW strikes over, but just joining a picket line <laughs> um, and supporting the workers there. Um, I think, um, 
I don't know. I think architects could form a union. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you, as someone who's organized picket lines and been on picket lines, to have, you know, just some regular person come and join a picket line is like the biggest deal to an organizer, it right? Is, it is. Um, I, oh, so um, I was in Los Angeles for work at USDA, and I was having a lovely morning. I had just come back from exercising, and it was just a beautiful morning. I went out. And then I came back to my hotel, and there was a picket line out in front of my hotel. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, I, I didn't know. I mean, they set up early in the morning, and I didn't see them. And so I checked out immediately. But I also went and joined them for a couple of, you know, for like a half an hour and just walked a picket line with them. So that, those types of things mean so much to organizers for you. You may not think it's a big deal, but it is a big deal to do that. So. I would also add a couple other things while you're saying that. Um, one is if you're an architect and if you have anything to do with contracting workers to work on your buildings, so you can make sure that they're unionized workers that are paid fairly. They have a higher level of health and safety standards. Um, that, that's another thing. You can look at when you vote for people, how do they stand on labor issues? Are they supportive of labor or not? And that, that be a part of your decision on who you decide to support. Um, and I'm sure there's other opportunities that'll come up, but those are the ones that I can think of. And you could also encourage um, the children of these, you know, union members to get involved in, in, you know, in your field and, you know, pursue things like, um, pursue education like you're doing. Yeah. Christine, I actually have a question. Okay. You mentioned how 70 to 80 percent of the population in the labor force is undocumented. So you uh, working at the Department of Agriculture, I'm wondering what are the conversations that are leading or about immigration policy reform and how we can get there to provide some form of citizenship status, knowing that the big problem is that they remain undocumented. Well, our... Um our secretary, Tom Vilsack, has repeatedly ca called for um, some sort of immigration reform. Um, he's also, um, within uh, USDA, we have a internal farm worker um, working committee um, where each of the different agencies within USDA has a, a representative, and we talk about you know, things that we can do to help, um, to help farm workers, agricultural workers. Um, Let's see. We also work a lot with um, the children of farm workers to let them know about different opportunities. Some of our um, internships, um, you know, even though I know that there is, you know, pride in farm work, there is also other opportunities within um, agriculture. So we work a lot with farm worker um, students to try and bring them into the USDA. Um, you know, it just it particularly in agriculture, it is just such a huge issue that everybody just puts their head under the sand and just doesn't want to talk about it. Um, and so until people are ready to sit down and, and you know, I'm sure you have all heard this before, Americans are not going to do that work. It's just not going to happen. We're not going to get to a place either where we, you know, build a bunch of machines that are able to pick. There are some crops that are always going to have to be hand harvested. So we are always going to need these workers, but we always want to make sure that these workers are protected. Um, there's been some movement to try and, um, you know, make, um, uh, give citizenship to just farm workers as, you know, as a, as a start. But, you know, not everybody's on board with that, with that is, issue. So... Yeah. I have a question, unless you have a question. Hey, there's room for maybe one more question. I'll wait to see. Um, I'm just wondering about um, the, the Senate bill that just came up on immigration. I, I, have you? I'm, tell me. Well, I'm just wondering what you thought of that, if, or if you, or more generally, do you have any hope that we will address immigration in the next, I don't know, 100 years, <laughs> 10, five years? It's just so hard. We just don't yeah. have, 
when you have people that don't even speak to each other and then just the harmful rhetoric that is that is from you know some of the top leaders in this country when they speak about about immigrants it is it is shameful and it's terrible um, yeah hard to have hope sometimes. it is Yes, but we will. Yes. Si se puede, like my grandfather said, <laughs> we will keep going. Yes. Yeah. Right on. Hello. Well, this marks the end of our event with Christine. Thank you so much. And for all the thoughts and questions from the audience. Thank you all once again. Thank you.